the compassionate, the merciful. Thirty years ago, Imam Khomeini was pictured behind him, led a nation of believers to, to form a revolution centered around the ideals of Islam and justice. And now, thirty years later, that revolution has impacted the life of every Iranian, every Muslim, and perhaps every individual on this globe. Our intention in the next two hours is to try and capture and engage the realities of this revolution and the realities of the impact of this revolution globally. As your MC tonight, I invite everyone to please attentively listen to our two honored speakers, and following it, we will have a question and answer session. I ask that you save all your comments and questions for the question and answer session. Thank you. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Hamid Algar. Dr. Algar is perhaps the only intellectual to have predicted the Islamic Revolution almost a decade before it occurred. He has met Imam Khomeini personally on several occasions, and he has written very extensively on the subject. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hamid Algar. Life appeared easy at first, and then difficulties occurred. Uh, the difficulties are those which have been confronted, uh, and in most cases, upon the left, surmounted in the past 30 years. Uh, but let me, uh, by way of uh, a, uh, a beginning, stress this element of Esh. What does Esh, love, have to do with revolution? I would say that in the last analysis, of course, I'm not political scientist, Dr. bit. Uh, in, in the first analysis and the last analysis, the Islamic Revolution of Iran was indeed an affair of Esh. It's an affair of love and the first place for Islam, of devotion to Islam, devotion to the traditions in particular of Shia Islam, devotion to the ideals of the Quran, uh, and devotion to the matchless mercy of the Mount Khomeini. 
uh, and I would like to begin, or maybe this is the third beginning, uh, with a, by invoking the memory of that noble and matchless personage. I had the great privilege and honor of meeting him on several occasions. My own reminiscences are not, in the larger scheme of things, uh, very important. However, they are for me a precious and of lasting significance. Uh, I was first introduced not to the person of the Imam, but to the writings and the ideas of the Imam by Shahid Mustafa Chandra, whose name will be familiar to many of you in this audience. Uh, he was here at Berkeley uh, for many years, uh, and it was he uh, who played uh, a, a significant role in raising Islamic awareness uh, among uh, Iranian students here at that time. Uh, and it was he who provided me with copies of some of the writings of Imam Khomeini uh, before he had become uh, well known outside of the country or outside the circle of, of the Iranian uh, Muslim activists. Uh, Shahid Chandran, as many of you may know, was also a person of great devotion uh, and uh, purity. Uh, and uh, after, he had, of course, an intermediate stage, he went to Lebanon. I was all important there, significant there in organizing the Islamic resistance. Uh, and then, uh, after the triumph of the revolution, uh, he went to Iran and became Minister of Defense. I was martyred uh, in the course of that which in Iran is correctly called the imposed war. That is to say, the war unleashed on, on, the, on, on Iran by Iraq at the instigation of, of a variety of foreign powers, of course, in the United States. In any event, uh, this was my first long distance, as it were, introduction to the Iran. Uh, I then met him in person for the first time uh, when he was still in the last stage of, of his prolonged exile at Notre Chateau in France. And in fact, this photograph behind me, uh, I'm pretty sure, was taken in Notre Chateau. He stayed in a modest house uh, in this uh, rural suburb of, of Paris, uh, and Three times a day, he would emerge from that house, come across the road, uh, and leave those of us who were visiting him uh, in prayer in a small garden. Uh, I spoke with him only briefly. But the important thing, at least for me, uh, about the Imam was that here was a man who spoke with his being, with his presence, not only with his words. Yeah, even before he spoke, and his words were precious, uh, his whole person, his whole bearing, spoke. Was a, the Imam was a man of dignity and humility at one and the same time. He was for me a living mistaf, a living, um, what shall I say in English, um, indicator, emblem of one who humbles himself before God and as a result thereby attains an unparalleled degree of dignity and respect among men. The Imam uh, was a person of supreme tranquility. Tranquil at the most critical times. For example, it is said that uh, when he was arrested and uh, sent into exile in 1964, uh, the Shah's agents uh, came to his house in Rome uh, in the dead of the night, bumped him in a car and took him off to the airport, the first stage of his exile in Turkey. Uh, and he himself was utterly calm. But the driver, the wretched man who had the job of transporting the Imam uh, into exile, was trembling and miserable. And the Imam calmed him down. He said, it's okay, don't worry. Uh, all will be well. Uh, and again, uh, at later stages, when he was returning to Iran, precisely from his exile, uh, in, <coughs> in uh, February uh, of 1979, uh, he sat there calmly on the plane, uh, and... Uh, drew a blanket over his head and went to sleep. Uh, at the same time, those that were accompanying him, or at least some of those who were accompanying him, uh, according to what they told me, told me uh, were terrified that once the plane landed in Tehran, after all the Shah's forces were still uh, on the rampage, well, the plane would be shot down, there would be denied landing, this, that, or the other. But the amount was calm. And throughout, they prolonged what is called the hostage crisis again. The Imam, on every conceivable occasion, exhibited total serenity and calmness. Uh, 
Contrast this with the behavior uh, of Carter at that time. Oh, it was sort of jittering nervously and twitching all the time, or whenever the subject of Iran came up. Uh, this is what I mean, a tranquility, a profound tranquility. Uh, that comes from realizing that all matters are ultimately in the hand of God, and the beauty of the Muslim, individually and collectively, is to submit himself to the will of Allah and attempt to implement it uh, in whatever way be appropriate. After the revolution, <coughs> Uh, I had, again, the privilege of meeting the Imam initially uh, in, I think it was December of 1979. Uh, <coughs> at that point, he was back in form and living in an extremely simple house, an extremely simple and small house. Oh, the simplicity in the living conditions of the Imam was truly remarkable. Uh, he spurned any form of comfort in his personal living arrangements. Uh, the only thing that uh, adorned the room where he sat was a folded blanket uh, on the ground, on the bed, not even a cushion on which to leave. But more important than, than this small detail, at least, what is, uh, what is it, rooted itself more firmly in my memory, uh, at one point uh, in his company, uh, and uh, projected this one, Alas he went on to the roof of his small house. Uh, which overlooked uh, a small uche, uche yachchor, as you call it. Uh, and it was blocked off at either end most of the time. But every now and then, the imam would go onto the roof uh, of the house, uh, and the gates at each end of the uche would be open, uh, and the people who were waiting uh, would pour through to catch a glimpse of the imam. And this is what I mean by esh, the esh of the revolution, as it relates to the that which uh, came forth from the people looking up at him, uh, standing on his roof, calmly waving and acknowledging him, was nothing other than love. It was not the blind obedience given to an authoritarian political leader or, or some chief politician who manipulates public opinion and gets himself elected president. It was the love of a, of a people for one who embodied their deepest, uh, most profound spiritual and religious and cultural ideals. This is the important thing, one of the many important things to remember about the Imam. Uh, that same month that I was in Tehran, December 79, was of course uh, marked by the so-called hostage license. Um, and I recall that in front of uh, uh, the U.S. Embassy, every day there were masses of people going back and forth, demonstrating, and at the same time celebrating. That which was called, by, I think by the Imam, uh, the Second Revolution. The First Revolution, of course, is getting uh, The Second Revolution uh, was the occupation of, of the U.S. Embassy. Uh, I have never seen a degree of popular enthusiasm uh, on any occasion nor do I expect to see it again, uh, comparable to what I saw in Tehran in 1979. It was the month in which, for example, the Constitution of the Islamic Republic was brought before a, ref a, a, a referendum and received overwhelming approval. It was a month also in which, from the U.S. Embassy, a whole series of documents began to emerge. Uh, and it is based on those documents, very largely, uh, that the U.S. Embassy, in effect, became renamed as Lania Josephsi, the Nestle Slides. Uh, to such a degree, uh, I recall I was staying with a friend in North Tehran, and I would take a bus.